All right, Spencer, welcome back. So I was just looking, so this is the actually the fourth time that we feature Cockroach. Uh, so the first time was actually in January of 2014, which feels crazy. Uh, Could it have really been January? I don't think the company got started till February. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Maybe it was before the company started. It, it was. Okay. It was. It was super early. And by the way, I, I, so like I'm a, I'm a proud investor. I am first. Mark is a proud investor in Cockroach DB, and the the, the, the story is like that's how we 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 how I crawled my way into into the deal. They're saying, hey, you know, there's actually a data community in New York, and that's for real, and people come and, you know, want to learn about technology. And I think, I think you took pity on me. It's like, oh, this guy's trying hard, so we can let him in. So I think that's... No, it's actually uh, an honor to be part of the data-driven at that time. I think we got some really interesting leads, and it was early for our product, yes. but just interest from folks in the community. So it was well worth doing it, and if anyone here is doing a startup, when you get a chance to participate with Data Driven, I recommend it. Okay, well, great, great answer. Thank you. So that's 2014, and then you were back in 2018, and then we had Nate Stewart, uh, your chief product officer and uh, board member, who was great during the pandemic online. And so this is the first time today. So this is great. So maybe as a um, you know, quick uh, refresher on Cockroach uh, Labs and Cockroach DB, uh, how you started it, why you started it, what the product does, all those good things. Yeah, so CockroachDB is a relational database. Uh, for those of you that don't know what that is, think Oracle's flagship database. That's probably the most famous. IBM DB2, which would run on mainframes, Microsoft SQL Server, Postgres, MySQL. So these are all relational databases. And the, the key, I think, thing if you take it one step back is these are operational databases. So they're the ones that hold all the metadata for your use case. So you know the, the items that you have in your inventory, if you're doing inventory management, uh, the, the balances and the, the debits and things in accounts if you're doing some sort of financial services use case. That's what you'd put in the operational database. And you contrast that to an analytical database like uh, Snowflake or, uh, the, you know, that's probably the, one, one of the most common ones. But there's, there's plenty of them. And the reason there's so many databases out there is because everything needs a database. So every single use case in the world has one of these things powering it. And that market's growing very quickly because people are building new use cases. So there's a lot of competition. And uh, there's also a lot of room in the solution space to, to find uh, uh, the kind of perfect combination of capabilities to push the envelope. And as things are changing very rapidly in the ecosystem, there's a lot of room to improve how operational databases work, in particular to use the cloud, to really leverage it, to make things like with all products or all infrastructure, you want to make things better in terms of capabilities, faster in terms of how they perform, and cheaper. And uh, we, we do strive to do all three of those things, some, some better than others, but it's always a work in progress. Yeah, do, do you want to double click on that history from the relational database of yesteryear, or, you know, Oracle, not to uh, pick on them, to document databases, to new SQL? Uh, what was the evolution? Ooh, yeah, there's lots of different threads that you could weave through the, the evolution of these systems. Uh, I think the, the, the Oracle, maybe as we start there, they certainly weren't the first of these uh, relational operational databases, but they really did become ascendant through the 90s and the, in the early aughts. And um, then I think where Cockroach's story really starts is when the, the World Wide Web came to prominence and all of a sudden there were use cases that were actually bigger than what you might call an enterprise use case where you had a certain number of customers for a big company. And all of a sudden you could reach most of the people in the world that had a desktop computer and then a mobile, a mobile um, app of some sort a little bit later. But that actually opened up a, a, a gap between what the capabilities of the existing operational databases like Oracle or MySQL could provide for and what the use case demanded. So I was at Google in 2002, and we kind of ran headfirst into this with their AdWords system, which very quickly grew beyond the capacity of a single MySQL instance. And so they started adding more MySQL instances. They divided the customers between the MySQL instances they had, and then they had to double that and double it again and double it again. And that actually started to create all kinds of other problems. And so Google started to innovate with databases as a result of that. And so they built Bigtable. Bigtable uh, is, is really, I think, one of the things, examples you could point to, and nothing's new in computer science, but it was definitely a prominent example that uh, 
introduced the idea of NoSQL. So Google actually was very intent on making a very scalable operational database. And uh, Bigtable was their answer to that, their first answer. But the, the interesting thing about Bigtable is that uh, they went for scale and they dropped all of the things that a relational database had evolved in terms of its capabilities that weren't directly related to just making the thing really, really big. So it didn't have transactions, it didn't have a relational language in which to query with, uh, and it didn't have a lot of these sort of schema management tools that help you manage complexity. But that was okay because Google just needed something that get very, very large. But even two years later, they said, you know what? We can't build application use cases without transactions. So they built something called Megastore. And then they decided that Megastore was only kind of a half measure and they wanted to redesign from the ground up. And they built something called Spanner. And Spanner is still what Google is uh, uh, you know, uh, building things internally and also providing on GCP. And it's Spanner that really inspired Cockroach. And to just give you a little bit of the genesis of Cockroach, after 10 years at Google, Myself and my, both of my co-founders uh, left to build a private photo sharing company. So we went from doing mostly infrastructure at Google to thinking, you know what, we want to build something for people to use, and particularly for us to use, because we didn't like sharing things publicly, but we wanted to share all of our photos when we were you know, on a weekend trip with friends. And we didn't, that was called Viewfinder. We didn't get product market fit on it. Snapchat, I think, was <laughs> the alternative at the time, and I think was uh, probably more in tune with the, the pulse of the general public than our, our more sophisticated, I think, but probably overly complicated solution. But we definitely wanted to build the back end for Viewfinder such that it would scale the way Google's infrastructure scaled. And that's where the idea of Cockroach was born because we realized coming out of Google that those kinds of capabilities that Google had pioneered internally were not available in open source, at least not yet. And so the idea of Cockroach was born, and we said, you know what? The Spanner-like capability should be brought to market for everyone else, and certainly as an open source product. And we didn't build it at Viewfinder, because we were trying to build a private photo sharing application and um, you know, platform. Uh, but we were acquired by Square two years into that journey. And at Square, that's where we saw, you know what? This problem is way bigger than our startup, as some ex-Google engineers. Square was struggling with databases as well, and we said, if you looked at all the problems Square was having, and they had something like 70 externally facing use cases when we joined them, most of the problems that they were struggling with could have been solved with the use of something like Spanner. So that really brought the idea of Cockroach back into our minds, and we stayed at Square for about 14 months, and then we said, you know what? Based on the signals we're seeing, and you talk to folks that were working at Dropbox and Pinterest and Yelp, and everyone had these kinds of problems, we said, you know, we, need to, we do need to follow this dream and this ambition and build a company around it. So that's pretty much when I met you. Yeah, and the, um, so the fundamental premise of, of, of CockroachDB is to be best of all worlds of like scalability and transactional reliability. What, what, what is the, like the, what, what does a product do today, I guess? Yeah, so that actually kind of brings up a, a question that some of you might have bugging you in the back of your mind. Why would we call anything cockroach DB? <laughs> it's not exactly a popular insect. Uh, it's really around survivability, and that was one of the key things that we, we sought to build into the product from the start. And it was one of the things that motivated Megastore at Google and then Spanner at Google. And this is an idea of that, hey, in the public cloud, things are just different. You have data centers just on the East Coast. You've got many data centers to choose from. And they're very close together. And if you can balance data across them, you could lose an entire data center and actually not miss a beat. No postmortems, no running around trying to get the things back online, potentially losing data. The thing can just continue maybe with a couple seconds of latency. So that was really cool. We built that in. The other big challenge we started out to solve was scale. So we really wanted to be able to support huge use cases. But you don't necessarily know whether your use case is going to be huge. And a great example of that is if you're trying to build a game. Right? If you build that with the wrong backend infrastructure that doesn't scale properly, then you're going to run into a success disaster if your game's popular. And so your thing's just going to fall flat on its face. And re-architecting something like that is is, is uh, not something that you do overnight. So you could really lose the momentum that a, a, a game uh, might have in the early stages that you really would like to capitalize on. So, uh, but that, I think that's true for any startup as well, any SaaS use case, anything you're building. If you have success in aggregate, your data needs are gonna be big. And so 
Cockroach was really built to scale. It can start small and can get very, very, very large, much bigger than one of those traditional relational databases I mentioned, like Oracle, for example. Those, those do have upper limits on how big they can get. But the interesting thing is that those capabilities were really the starting point. As we've been on this now eight-year journey, we've realized that uh, the architecture supports other really interesting capabilities. When I say the architecture, the way, way to think about Cockroach is it's distributed. There's lots of nodes that participate. That's part of how it gets so big. It's also part of how it can survive. You, know, you lose a data center, well, there's other nodes of Cockroach that are running that have some of the redundancy that are running in other data centers, and those can pick up the slack. Uh, but we also realized that the companies we were talking to increasingly were multinational companies, or they were even startups, but they very much wanted to entertain customers that might join them or use their massive multiplayer gaming platform from Brazil or from Turkey or from Japan. And you, would, uh, you really would like to try to support those more global use cases. And so we realized, hey, we've got a distributed architecture. We should be able to introduce new capabilities into the operational database to support that. So if you think about something like Twitter or Quora, if someone posts something, you want that to be visible everywhere. And ideally, you'd like that to be consistent around the world. Uh, at the same time, you might have data that you absolutely do not want replicated all over the world. Like you're building a private wealth management system. <laughs> you definitely want to keep all the data replicated in the user's legal jurisdiction. And balancing those things, have, have those concerns, and having a, a database fundamentally support them is quite important. And we'll, we'll talk, I, I know that you're planning to ask me about some other, even more recent uh, capabilities of Cockroach, but I think the, the larger lesson here is just that the work's never done. Right? The, the world's changing very rapidly. Infrastructure has to change as well. And we've just seen over, well, the 25 years I've been trying to solve problems with databases, you improve the state of the art in the database and the application use cases quickly use those capabilities. And then you design the next version of the database and then the applications use that and want more and it just goes on and on and it's sort of an arms race. Yeah, so let's get into that. So we started talking about this evolution of uh, SQL to NoSQL to uh, you know, new SQL and the category in which uh, Cockroach arguably uh, falls into. So the, the, you, you, you seem to be going towards this concept of a data cloud or cl uh, where does a cloud fit into this? And then the next step after that, which is serverless. But let, let's talk about the, the data cloud. You hear a lot about the data cloud these days. I'm not exactly sure what it is. Uh, you know, one, one observation I'll have about sort of the idea of convergence in data infrastructure is that it's very, very difficult to build a piece of infrastructure that serves as an operational database. Just like it's very difficult to build a piece of infrastructure that serves as a data warehouse or a, a data lake or a, an analytics system of some sort. In order to be the very best in that, you have to, I think, have a, a, a somewhat single-threaded focus in, in the product category that you're trying to compete in. Otherwise, you become a jack of all trades and a master of none, I think is the, the way people put it. And so I, I don't see, I, I see consolidation in some products, but in general, the, the industry leaders in each product category will continue to have a, a, a more narrow focus. But uh, you know, I mentioned before, the cloud is fundamentally changing things and, and offering incredible opportunities to, to do things, again, faster, better, cheaper. Right. Uh, the, the, the realization that we had is the cloud allows you to get resources almost anywhere uh, programmatically and in seconds or minutes even. Now that's, that is a fundamental change from the way the world used to work. And in fact, companies that still do have their own data centers struggle with this problem continuously, which is it can take months to get a new piece of hardware or to find the floor space in your data center to put it in. Anyone that uses the public cloud, which I assume is almost everyone in this room, those, those, those concerns seem fairly uh, ancient. <laughs> but the reality is uh, that, you know, that, that's a relatively recent improvement in, in terms of what the cloud can bring and how you can build on it. Uh, and I mentioned before, well, the public cloud has data centers multiple data centers in single regions and in regions all over the planet and over every continent. That's also a, a fundamentally uh, big change. But also the public cloud has many other services that you can start to build on. So if, if everyone in here is aware of Snowflake, I mean, they're, they're building on the, the cloud uh, data storage primitives like S3 or uh, Google Cloud Storage. 
And uh, that's, that's a huge benefit by having that primitive uh, that's able. That's allowed them to to do things uh, much more efficiently than earlier systems that had to essentially build those kinds of capabilities into their product. So I, I think that's that's the future of things. How can you leverage the cloud and continue to leverage it every time someone else in the ecosystem builds something that could be useful? It's an opportunity. Yep. So everything as a service. Um we talked about distributed. Do you want to talk about um, serverless and maybe start with a definition because uh, not everybody may, may know what that means? Yes, yeah, serverless is uh, an overloaded term at this point. Uh, so most, it was introduced with, uh, I think, I'm sh like I said, nothing's new in computer science, so I don't know what the very first usage was, but the one that I became aware of was AWS's Lambda. So the, the right way to think about that is it's a, it's a serverless execution layer so that you could actually run your application code in a little snippet, a function basically, that could be called and you don't have to run a server that has your application logic permanently resident on it, ready to serve queries. Instead what happens is a query comes in and it might just be one every week, it might be 100 a second, it might be 10,000 a second, whatever it is, the execution layer that's serverless it uses some server capacity somewhere to execute your logic on demand and it charges you only for what you used. So that's, that's sort of, that, that was the, I think, initial introduction for most people of the concept of serverless. And that's at the execution layer. But every execution layer has to deal with data. Otherwise, it's not a very interesting application use case. Like a mortgage, mortgage calculator, <laughs> it doesn't store any data. Right? You put in the little things and it spits something out. That's a very simple application. But virtually every application needs to go hit a database somewhere. Uh, and databases are very much seen as, as being, uh, you know, resident somewhere. And that's very true. It has, there needs to be uh, at least something that uh, is holding the data and making it available. Uh, however, like a lot of the principles of serverless uh, are applicable to data storage. And in particular, you want to be able to start very small and get very large without having to worry about how many nodes you have, where they are, how big the nodes are how they have to be uh, you know, upgraded in terms of their operating system and so forth. In other words, the idea of serverless abstracts you above the concerns of, a, uh, of dealing with actual servers and everything that's, uh, that, that, that's associated with them. Also, you really want to be able to pay for exactly what you use and pay as you go. So that's another really uh, amazing feature of serverless. And that, of course, applies to the database, uh, or at least it, it, it can. And that's something that Cockroach brought to market. Uh, and, and so this idea is just that if you want to store a, uh, just a tiny bit of data when you start, way less, for example, than, than you would have the capacity to store if you had just the smallest node possible running your database. The smallest node that's available on AWS is actually still a, 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 a potentially way more powerful database, uh, much more capacity than you might need for your use case that doesn't have any users on it yet. Let's say you're a startup and you're trying to work to product market fit and you release your very first version and you haven't done very much advertising yet or anything. It's just friends and family that are on it. It'd be nice not to pay for a resident VM that's running your database permanently, but that's sort of the, the non-serverless version of things. But serverless, if you use literally you know, a, a single uh, byte of data, that's all you get charged for. And that's, that's an interesting way to start but then you have a very smooth way to scale up so that you're elastically using exactly what you need. And when we started looking at the problem of doing multiple regions, so we've got users in Western Europe, users in the United States, maybe users East Coast and West Coast are separate because the latency is important. You start to realize that to service all those customers, if you've got a use case that, like a game, as I mentioned before, that doesn't have many users yet and you don't really know where they're gonna show up, then serverless really becomes obvious as being something that's critically useful. Because if you, Australia is not where you have users yet and there's only you know, 10 users there, you'd like to not be charged for a bunch of resources that are sitting in Australia and not being used. Right? With serverless, you have an ability to have a very large physical cockroach cluster, which Cockroach Labs would run. It's available in the cloud. And all of the customers can use that physical infrastructure but only use a, a sort of fractional virtual cluster that slices through the physical 
infrastructure. So if there's just a tiny bit of usage in Australia, you pay for a tiny bit of usage. If most of your usage is in North America, you can scale as big as you need to there. But again, across the entire global footprint, you're being you're using only the resources that you need and you're only paying for the resources you use. When did you launch the serverless product? So serverless came out in, uh, in beta in, uh, whew, I don't know the exact month, but it's been more than a year now. And we released a general availability version of it in July of this year. So one of your key customers, at least uh, publicly, is Netflix. I think it'd be really interesting to um, use this as an example. How does a company like Netflix use Cockroach? Well, actually, that, that gets to another interesting point. So we have a number of different flavors of Cockroach because that's actually been necessary in our evolution of, as a company. We started off, and Cockroach was something that you ran yourself. We call that self-hosted. Because when, when we got started, that's how most of the, the bigger customers we had were insisting that they wanted to use databases. These are our operational databases. This is the thinking, right? And this is what we're, we're used to running these ourselves. This is storing our most valuable sort of crown jewels, the data for our operational use cases. And um, if, you're, if we're going to use a new technology, we're going to run it in our sort of information security envelope with the, the people and the processes that we trust. And so we had that self-hosted product. Uh, we, we quickly started realizing that there was a, a, the, the kind of new wave, and certainly the future, even for those uh, existing self-hosted customers, was going to be to use a cloud product that was a service that was managed. Right? So in other words, the way that AWS offers their databases to all of their customers. Uh, and so we started building that cloud product. And then what we started realizing is that uh, serverless would, was going to be an improvement on that, and we started building the serverless product. So we actually have a, uh, those at least three broad categories of, of how our product is, is offered to customers. And you mentioned Netflix. Netflix is one of these self-hosted customers. Uh, that's how they still want to run their databases. Uh, but they are moving in the direction of, of using cloud. So there's going to be a, sort of a hybrid reality for some time. And I think if you look at the horizon, everything will be cloud. So we, we do support a very flexible way of deploying Cockroach. And Netflix, as you all might imagine, has uh, probably thousands of use cases. I'm not exactly sure how many. I think that uh, that's probably accurate. But a lot of things that they offer. And some of those things are massive, and some of those things are very small. And uh, Cockroach is, is uh, solving a number of different problems for them. I think the, the most difficult problem, obviously scale is one, and survivability or re business continuity is, is clearly another. So those are the bread and butter of Cockroach. But the multi-region is also uh, a major concern. And that's uh, an area where Cockroach is uh, quite differentiated in the market. And so they, they've already, uh, I think uh, they, they gave a recent talk, which is on YouTube. So this is not any kind of private information, but they, they have hundreds of Cockroach clusters already. So you can just see how, how quickly the, the usage of this can, um, can increase within an organization that, that has a lot of uh, use cases that, that need these capabilities. Yeah, and, and building on this point of um, self-hosted to cloud to serverless, if you were going to start a database company today, would you go directly to the cloud as, as the market evolved that way? That's a really good question. I think maybe not, but my God, if you thought about having to build all the things that we've built over eight years, I don't know if I'd want to start the company. The reason I say it would be hard to imagine just going straight to serverless, although that would be the only way that you, you, you could think about doing it I, for the reason I just mentioned. But the reason that would be difficult is, well, there's, there's a lot of competition if that's the only way that you run. Right? If you want to win, at least in 2022, the global 2000 as customers, you really do have to have a product that, that runs in a variety of different configurations. Uh, because people are, uh, I think, reasonably hesitant to, 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 to adopt a solution that only works in, in, in a single fashion. So I, I mean, I'm not saying it's, it's not possible. I, I, I agree with you. We'd probably go directly to, to serverless if, that was, uh, if we were starting today. But I'm glad we don't have to make that choice, because the fact that we run in as many different um, configurations as we do is extremely appealing. Uh, to the high end of the market, which is, I think, where also the differentiators I mentioned, scale, resilience, multi-region, those are incredibly important differentiators to the high end of the market 
a little less to the low end. Although you, you do see in the emerging companies that are going to become part of the Fortune 500 in the next five years, five to 10 years, they, uh, many of them do have those kinds of use cases. So we, 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 we have a, a nice distribution of companies across those two segments. But um, the, the world's biggest companies are um, prime candidates for our software. And at the very beginning, and I guess still today, you were a very successful uh, open source company. Uh, do you think the world has evolved as well? You know, there was a time everybody hated open source as a business model, and then it switched to everybody loved open source, and open source was the only way. Do, do you think that has evolved? Yeah, unquestionably, it's evolved. So when we started, we adopted what's called the open core business model. So the idea here is that you have an open source product that drives really broad adoption. So you get some level of ubiquity. Many, many, many people are using it because, hey, it's open source. It's very, very easy to download, to work with. You're not paying up front for the software. You may eventually pay for support. That was sort of the Red Hat model for open source. But the idea with the open core model is that open source product would just be the core. And what you do when you started getting that ubiquitous adoption is you start to introduce enterprise features, which would be a different license. Uh, most people would adopt with the core, and then you'd upsell them to the constellation of enterprise features that uh, essentially form the, the, the basis of your um, enterprise offering, let's say. The, the, that business model, I think, lasted about four or five years. <laughs> uh, when we started the company, it was, it was uh, I think, a, a good bet that that's, that was the right way for us to do it. And we operated under that until it started to become clear that um, open source business models were under threat, in particular from some of AWS's actions. So they really uh, went after Elasticsearch. That was one that they, I think, changed the nature of the open source business model and made it, uh, the open core business model, and made it, um, I think, less uh, less likely that you'd succeed. And what Amazon did is they said, well, you know, we can, we can repackage the open core, put our own enterprise things around it, and most of the work's already been done for us to create this piece of software, and we're going to repackage it. And with that, in addition to the incumbent cloud platform, uh, means that we're going to be able to get huge numbers of customers just because everything's integrated. It's all part of the same billing system. All the identity and access management works together. So you have all the advantage of uh, of, of the cloud platform, uh, you know, combined with the you know quality of the open source offering. And so as soon as people started to to wrestle with that, the open core model became less tenable. And Interestingly, at that exact same time, the, the idea of really uh, offering things as a, a service in the cloud, uh, first and foremost, and, and worrying a little less about open source, was also quite ascendant. Again, because of Amazon, I think, more than any company. So they, they offered both like, uh, the, 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 the twilight <laughs> of one business model and, and really ushered in uh, the, the future there. And I, I do think that if you, if you think about the progression here. You had closed source software, open source software, and then let's say cloud services. They make sense because they're moving along a gradient of uh, you know, essentially less cost. Right? And the cost isn't always measured easily in dollars and cents. It could even be measured in time, for example. Uh, time to value uh, and, and the resources required to run something in production. So you went from closed source software, which was incredibly expensive to, uh, to, to actually to buy it and to use it because you actually had to go through procurement. So you'd talk to some salesperson that might uh, you know, have a, a relatively long process and you have to go through uh, legal wrangling, go through procurement, and eventually they send you a, a bunch of printed manuals. And there wasn't really a community necessarily that was online, uh, but this is just the dominant mode of how software was purchased. And you can see why that was so ripe for disruption. And when open source came along, it was very easy to both get that community to very rapidly try out the software, uh, to, to run with it. You didn't actually pay for the software up front. Of course, you paid for the hardware and so forth. Uh, the idea of services actually takes that a step further. Uh, 
uh, not because the ideas are free, that was some of the nice things about open source, but because the, uh, the process of actually running the software is no longer something you have to learn how to do. So the time to value in the sort of day one plus operations is something that was, uh, you know, respectively um, decreased and uh, in, in, in on both dimensions, right? So I think what we see with serverless and our serverless offering, for example, is free. So it's perpetually free relational database cluster up to a certain um, threshold of utilization. And so it's, it's kind of like what we, what we think is available in, in sort of this next generation of value proposition for infrastructure is that you can both acquire the software very rapidly because it's just a service. You don't have to learn how to run it. And there's even a free tier, which is you know, at least as free as open source was in the sense that uh, you, 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 know, you always had to pay for the hardware with open source and the support. So I think that same idea, you have the pass through costs of the cloud and you also have the support. So it's kind of like what, what you're moving along there is just less resources required to successfully um, implement a use case using infrastructure that's available. So it's kind of like open source ate the software world. And now I think cloud services are very much cannibalizing the, um, the open source business model. And that's not to say that open source is going away. I don't believe that's true at all. So you'd still recommend uh, open source as a strategy for most enterprise software? It's a good question because people ask me that all the time when they're doing startups. You know, what, should, we, should we open source this or not? And I, I think the answer is, is, is are the, the other core benefits of open source really important to that community? Because sometimes they are. I'd say it'd be hard to imagine a relational database at this point that isn't open source. But you know, that might be the case. I, I do think that you, know, you really just need to look at what's the, what's the best way to deliver value to the customer. And I think that that can be done um, quite easily without open sourcing code. And so the, the mandate to open source is not nearly as strong as it was when we started Cockroach. Maybe, maybe uh, last sort of question or theme from me because then I want to open up for, for, for questions. Um, what are some lessons learned on the go to market side? You know, particularly in the, in the light of um, like the, the three of you founders were like super deeply technical people who had to learn a lot of the go to market and um, you know in a, in a context of a shifting environment from open source to cloud and all the things. But so. Um, how did you start? How did you get the first customers? What worked? What didn't? And then as you evolve towards more of a sales organization, what, when did you do it? Why did you do it? How did you do it? That's a good question. You know, when we started Cockroach Labs, I realized that we'd probably be an enterprise software company. And that made me very nervous because I'd never really dealt with that problem before. I'd, I'd built software at Google, for example, for Google engineers. And that was sort of more of the, the, the mental model I was comfortable with and the idea of having potentially hundreds or thousands of, of customers that uh, needed to be supported was, was, um, was something I had to get my head wrapped around. Um, I, I will say that it's, <laughs> it's very easy when you're, when you're the sort of chief technical evangelist to go and talk to customers and it's something you should do very early and often and try to find those design partners. Um, it's very hard, though, to sell, uh, especially to a larger organization. And I, I quickly realized that uh, the, 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 the gulf between um, being able to get somebody very interested in your software and actually getting an MSA and uh, a signed contract and money in the door was uh, not something that I was going to cross on my own. And so we, we hired our first uh, account executive and SE pair. And I watched how uh, these two went after some of the customers that were interested in Cockroach. And can, I, actually, uh, can we double click just on that piece? Because that's a question that comes up all the time. You're a young startup, you're very technical founders. Who's your first AE? What, are they young with high slope? Are they experienced? Who, who are they? It's an interesting profile. You, you definitely don't want somebody that uh, you know, has, has, has been working at a scaled organization and uh, really understands how to manage sales folks, scale the team, uh, expects marketing to have a, you know, a certain amount of um, leads inbound and so forth. In those early stages, you need somebody that specializes really in an exploratory sales motion. Because you don't know how much you can charge for your software yet. Um, you, you certainly don't know what kind of messaging is gonna work. 
who your ideal customer looks like. Um, you're trying to figure these things out. So you need somebody that can go into any customer and really just listen. I mean, to be fair, that's always what you should be doing in a sales motion. But I think some people are really geared towards listening with their ears perking up when someone mentions something that just might have something to do with your product, right? Because you just don't know exactly what, what that motion looks like yet and you have to figure it out. And there's a lot of things it could be, right? So that uh, there is a certain kind of sales, early sales leader that specializes in that. But as soon as that person starts to figure out what that motion looks like, you're probably gonna need to replace them because the person that can figure that out is not usually the person that can mentor other salespeople and start to scale an organization and, and really codify that motion into something that can be taught through enablement to a larger sales organization. And then um, fast forward to today, you have uh, more of a top-down sales-led kind of motion, do you, or do you still get juice from the community and some bottoms-up, inbound? Uh, what does it look like at scale? Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a combination of a lot of different things. We, we definitely, we still get open source lift, which is interesting. We, we get it through increasingly a product-led growth motion with our serverless platform, and we're, we're, we're extending some of the principles and product-led growth even to upmarket uh, in, in terms of, for example, how, how is the product experience, let's say a really big Fortune 10 bank is betting on your product you know, strategically and it's being rolled out within the, the bank, you want all the individual teams in that organization to experience the benefits of a product-led growth motion. And so like those principles apply, if, it, if it's all top-down and sales-led, it's very hard to scale, very expensive to scale. So you, you, you do want to balance those, but it depends on your, your use case. With CockroachDB and probably any database that's operational, it's a solution sale. It's very involved, there's multiple stakeholders, um, it's, it's, it's kind of a double-edged sword, right? If you, it can be very difficult to get past all the hurdles and all the technical evaluations and, the, and the, the, just even the contracts and things because this is, this is a very uh, important part of the stack. If it goes down, everything goes down, right? So the contracts become more fraught as a result. So um, you, know, you, you do need to have the right kind of sales organization to, to accomplish that sale. And I'll just say that in the go-to-market, maybe the most counterintuitive learning that I've had, and it should give people that are on this journey um, maybe a little bit of an optimistic perspective, but you'd think that when something does go wrong with your operational database, <laughs> you know, that customer is not going to be uh, happy at all. In fact, they might churn on you because you failed them in a very critical thing and, you know, cockroach is not supposed to go down, right? So you, you, the, the, I think the, the sort of at first blush, a failure with your operational database means you're going to churn a customer. In fact, that's not true. You're actually more likely to churn a customer if they never have a problem with your software. Because they, they look at it and like, why aren't we just using the open source version of this? There's nothing that's wrong with this. We don't need support. What are we paying all this money for? Like, this is a very expensive line item. Uh, and what we found is that when, not that we encourage things to go down by any means. Oof, no, uh, we, you know, we take every customer problem as, as our failure, you know, and, and work around the clock to fix them. But when, when you do have a problem, the right way to look at it is it's an opportunity. It's an opportunity to build substantial trust with the customer. And if, if they see that you, you are partnering with them at the level that their issue is the, your top concern, just like it's their top concern, then that actually sets you up for a, a very uh, long relationship of, with trust and also a huge opportunity for expansion because you're now seen as a partner that, um, that they can rely on for the long term. So, you know, they say that, you know, all of these crises are opportunities. And I think with, with infrastructure at the very least, which is what I've been having my head in for the last eight years, this is absolutely true. So it's not that a, you ever welcome a failure, but there, you know, you want to put all your energy behind solving it. That's such an interesting insight. Uh, I'll add last question from me because I just think it's so interesting um, uh, and so relevant to what uh, a lot of people are, are trying to do in terms of building companies to support a customer uh, in 
that scenario? What, what did you do and what do you do? Do you like you take your engineers and you assign them or do you have a customer success team that's deeply technical? Like who, who does this and how does it work and who do they report to in the organization? Well, obviously, like all things, this evolves. Just like I mentioned the exploratory sales leader, which then evolves into somebody that can scale the organization and run the enablement. The customer success side of the story also evolves. At the beginning, it's it's literally the database engineers, at least in our case, that are, that are working on these things because we didn't have a customer success team. But wow, it's pretty interesting customer success, right? I mean, certainly if something goes wrong with Oracle, you don't have the, the chief Oracle database engineer like working day and night on your problem. If you did, it would probably get fixed <laughs> more definitively. Uh, so, you know, it's kind of like, that's something that you can actually bring into the early sales conversations. And right? like, well, you know, you are extremely important to us as a customer, you're a partner, you're gonna influence our roadmap and we care more about your problems than any other vendors ever going to, right? So you, you can actually sell that. So in the early days, it really was, including me, like everyone would be on these problems and would be, would be working to solve them. But then you, you hire your first customer success, uh, you know, your first, actually it was technical support that we hired first, then customer success. And you know, in terms of escalations, you have to be careful as you get bigger how you do that. Um, you want, I think, to continue to have your, your, your engineers that know the product better than anyone available when an escalation demands it. You also want to create a little bit of a, of a wall so that they don't get um, distracted to the point where they can't do uh, their work on the roadmap, which is also incredibly important. So there's a balance there. And, and ultimately, what you want to do is, is to increasingly push uh, solutions into knowledge bases and into the product itself. Uh, in terms of observability in particular. You wanna see that there's classes of errors that you start to recognize or problems that customers have where first you can get your technical support and customer success folks to do what before you needed engineers to do because now they, can, they, they have tools internally where they can actually see some of the things much more clearly than they previously were able to because you're actually saying, you know what, this is a class of problems that we can surface very transparently if we built uh, this new thing into the dashboard. Right, so that's great, and eventually you want to push that so that the customer can, can easily diagnose their problems and has ways to fix it that they understand. And eventually you want to make it so that you eliminate classes of problems. And maybe you're trying to do all of those at once to some extent, but you get better and better at that cycle. But that's part of, that's part, it's one of the really chief inputs uh, in any product development cycle. It's not just the new capabilities, but it's how do you make the product more and more bulletproof and observable. Super great, thanks for sharing. All right, questions. I just, I just saw that Google introduced what they're calling blockchain node engine for Web.3, like a, a database to, you know, that can be used for the Web3 for large application you know, use. And I was just wondering if that's a market you're looking at because it does scale. Uh, it's, it's, an, it's an interesting question which we've been getting since the advent of the blockchain, I'd say. Uh, you know, to, right now the answer is no. I think there's ways probably that um, Cockroach absolutely would be used in, in a Web3 context. And we actually have a number of companies that are trying to build Web3 type solutions, which is supposed to be completely decentralized, right? But the companies that are building that often need their own metadata for their customers, right? So that's where Cockroach would be used. And, you know, as, as, a, as relation, relational operational databases go, Cockroach is pretty decentralized. So you would actually have the ability even in that case where you're trying to create centralized metadata for your for your larger decentralized system, you would might still want to, for example, geo partition so that you're really keeping the data close to the customer and within their legal jurisdiction and so forth. But I'd say that the the kind of um, <laughs> maybe the <laughs> I'm trying to think of the right way to say it uh, the the sort of underbelly of the promise of Web3 is just that typically, even for these decentralized use cases, you want some centralization. And I think that's, that's really where Cockroach is focused at the moment and, and less around um, trying to uh, store things on the blockchain. It's just, they're, they're a little bit different in terms of how they'd be used. You're welcome. All right, one more question. Uh, so, hello. Yep. Spencer, thank you for the talk today. So vendor lock-in is one of the things that uh, enterprises try to avoid during the sales cycle. So how do you think about it and talk about it with the prospects? And also once you have a customer, how do you talk to them about um, not getting locked in? At the same time, you do want lock-in. 
Um, so how do you balance the two during the sales cycle and also when it comes to retention? Yeah, that's a really good question. Uh, the, so there's a whole bunch of uh, facets to it. You know, no, one is that, well, we're open source, right? So you, can, you, you don't have to keep using our service. You don't even have to keep using our support. There is an off-road uh, or off-ramp. And uh, at the same time, of course, we do have some enterprise features. And that's probably the, the answer for you about how you actually maintain some degree of lock-in that's useful to your business. You got to keep innovating. Right, so uh, and, and you, you do need to reserve some of what your, your value proposition is that's only available if they remain a customer. So there's different ways to do that. Uh, we also, you know, Cockroach looks like Postgres. And Postgres, of course, is, is a very widely adopted database. And many databases that aren't Postgres look like Postgres. We're not the only one. I mean, Google has them and, uh, you know, there's other, there's other startups. And so that, that's another answer. But I think the largest answer, especially when you're talking to big companies, is they're not worried about the vendor lock-in for Cockroach Labs. I mean, maybe mildly. What they're worried about is the vendor lock-in from the hyperscale cloud vendors. They're very worried about that. So the right way to assuage their concerns isn't so much to convince them that they're not going to be locked into your system. It's to convince them that if they use your system, they're not going to be locked into any particular cloud vendor that even they have the opportunity to repatriate off the cloud vendors and run their own data centers if they get big enough where that actually becomes economically advantageous. And we have a number of those customers. So it's kind of like, um, that's the elephant in the room, right? You, you want to speak to that as opposed to your own vendor lock-in, and I think you get a lot more benefit. All right, one last question. Can you talk about what in the MySQL architecture actually limits its ability to scale? Um, I'd be curious to hear your, your take on that. Is it something like sharding just not being natively supported or, or something else um, that didn't allow you guys to, to you know, scale at Google? Yeah, so you know, MySQL is a, an example of what's called a monolithic architecture. So really, it's addressing the resources that are available in a, in a sort of single integrated machine. So you can scale those machines up, you know, 128 cores. Or what I don't know what the the limit is today. You know, with with Oracle and DB2, you're actually potentially running on hardware that you know far exceeds what the sort of capacity of the the maximum commodity rack hardware would be in a cloud vendor. You're using a, an IBM mainframe, or you're using a Cray supercomputer or something like that. But even those are, have a super linear cost curve and they have a definitive ceiling on how big they can get. Uh, so when you're using a monolithic architecture, you're really limited to how big you can scale um, either one machine or a very tightly coupled set of machines if you start to distribute. Uh, MySQL is, I think, uh, best described as uh, not really paying as much attention, for example, as Oracle or DB2 has to that scaling problem. Uh, and when we when we were building AdWords at Google, that was in the year 2002, I guess, 2003, when we were doing that. And uh, I don't think all that much has changed in terms of the internal architecture of MySQL. Google was solving that problem with MySQL by doing the sharding outside of the database. And the, the realization at Google at that time was that's a, that's a fraught architecture. Right? If you don't solve the problem of scale inside the database, you lose the database guarantees. And you're, you're spending a huge amount of time at the application level and in the operational level of managing many independent MySQL shards uh, without the benefit of things like transactions. Um, and just to give you an example, with AdWords, they had eBay as a customer. And eBay didn't fit into a single shard. So you had this other weird problem, not just how do you put lots of customers onto one shard and you have many shards, but you actually have customers that are so big they don't even fit into one shard, so you're breaking the customer up between shards. So you're gonna see that the, the complications of not solving that, uh, that problem at the database level actually result in tremendous costs in the software engineering and the SREs and things to run the system that you've had homegrown, which then you keep running. So Google didn't replace that system with Spanner, I think for, almost 10 years. So by that time, it had gotten to 1,000 plus shards of MySQL. Um, in contrast, though, and just to give you an idea that I'm not, I'm, I am actually a pretty big fan of MySQL. It's a kind of an amazing system in its own right. 
Facebook has hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of shards of MySQL now. And they've, they've gone and implemented a meta database using MySQL as sort of the, the per node uh, you know, constituent. And it blends all those together into truly massive systems that have certain, certain properties that make sense for Facebook's use case. Uh, Facebook's so large, they, they, you know, Cockroach has never uh, been shown to work at that kind of scale. I mean, it's literally millions of nodes. So that, that's, a, that's an interesting problem and in that they built a purpose, they have a purpose-built solution for it. So MySQL is still very much useful, but I'd say that where Cockroach shines is, you know, if, you, if you're not Facebook, <laughs> we're serving 3 billion active users, uh, I think that uh, is a more common kind of company and there's only one of those in the world. All right, on that note, uh, that's uh, a wrap for today. Thank you so much for sharing all of this uh, from a you know, tech perspective, market perspective, go-to-market perspective, super great. Uh, I hope you come back soon for a fifth time. Uh, and uh, I think you need to run now, unless that's changed. Like, I think you need to go to dinner. So thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. It's my pleasure, Matt. Thank you.